There are hundreds of videos that haven't been launched on YouTube on Patreon. Make sure you guys join the Patreon to help us grow. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. We're going to talk about Jeremiah, Daniel, fell prophecies in the Bible with a good guest that we've already had on. But before we do, guys, I got the merch. Check out the link down in the description if you guys want to rock it. I've also got the We Are Myth Vision on the back. Anyway, I'm excited about that. I just got that done in Teespring, and you guys can check that out down in the description. I really, really appreciate that. So with that being said, I have Jim Majors joining. What's going on, brother? Man, just same old same trying to... Well, I've already submitted my dissertation for... Uh, for uh, I've already submitted it to the committee for their approval. And if they approve it, then I go on to defend it orally and uh, officially. And hopefully I will be graduating this semester. Dude, that's awesome. So he is obviously up and coming PhD candidate in Oklahoma and fingers crossed he passes the dissertation. Is there a way you can give us a hint of what your dissertation is on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's on, uh, the book of Daniel, but more specifically, um, it is on the methodology behind the, uh, the composition of it. And so as most people know, uh, the major, the majority of biblical scholars believe that Daniel was, was, uh, fine in its final form composed in the second century, uh, BCE. Um, during the and the Antiochian crisis, uh, so between 167 and 164, about 165 is what most scholars believe it was uh, composed. Um, and so, but some, some of the text is older in chapters two through six. There's a lot of older text uh, in chapters nine. There's a prayer that's that's pro that's quite a bit older. Um, but chapter seven through 12 is different. Chapter seven, seven through 12 has all the hallmarks of a second century BCE document. Um, uh, it's as uh, basically, um, it's basically pseudepigrapha. Um, it's written in the name of somebody else by somebody who's not that person. Interesting. <laughs> and I'm sure it gets really complex what you argue. And I'll be obviously yeah, interviewing right. you at some point once you argue your dissertation. I'm sure we can do a presentation of it if, if you'd be interested on the show, because I love this kind of stuff. Um, sure. I but, gave you it, it, Yeah. I was going to say, it, it, essentially, what, what it's uh, I had to, to highlight that just so people would, would get what my dissertation is about, because uh, I theorize... Um, why these certain texts were selected and not other texts and for what purpose they selected these texts for. Interesting. So he's diving deep. I can't wait to do that. I gave you a call the other day and I was like, look, man, <clears throat> I'm sorry. We, we can't half ass deal with these prophecies. We cannot play around with these prophecies. I told you that I was a full preterist for those who don't know. That means it's fulfilled in the past, but more than that, more than just the idea that I'm full preterist, the majority of Christians believe that these prophecies have been or will be fulfilled as if they are some ongoing prophecy and that the Bible would never have failed prophecies unless it's a false prophet. But Daniel's not in that. Jeremiah's not in that. Ezekiel, which I've had Dr. Joshua uh, Bowen come on and show Ezekiel's failed prophecy. And of course, I've got him hunting for other ones to do coming up shows that we can deal with. I figure we would dive into Jeremiah and you could present a straightforward, clear what's going on in the mindset. And like, if you don't mind, I want you to play like the obvious what we have here, but then like break it down and like for dummies like me and say, now, listen, this is evidence. It didn't happen. So they changed it to say this or they made it sound like, um, Oh, well, because you didn't keep your end of the deal, God is pushing it another, you know, hint, hint, it didn't happen kind of thing. And like, give us some of that stuff as you describe these uh, prophecies. But look, I don't want to tell you how to do your presentation. I'm going to try not to ignore it, <laughs> try to not interrupt you. But I kind of like want, I'm sure people will understand that, but maybe you can break it down when something comes. Go, bingo, don't you see it? Just to let it flash in people's eyes. Because, dude, it might go right over their head and they just don't see what you're saying. 
So with that being said, Derek Lambert will remain silent and listen to what you have to say. Thank you. Okay, so the passages that you're talking about in Jeremiah are Jeremiah 25, 11 through 12 and Jeremiah 29, 10. And they say that um, the dominion of Babylon will last for 70 years. And in 70 years, the Jews will be restored and Israel will be restored. Um, so historically, that um, that is incorrect on all fronts. Um, so Daniel had to come up with, with or the, the author of Daniel um, had to come up with some way by, by choosing these texts that, that reflected a time of uh, a time of persecution, a time where they uh, were taken from their land, um, you know, the, the Babylonian exile. Um, while they weren't in exile in the, the Maccabean era, uh, where when the text was composed, they were out of their, um, like they were, it was during a period where they were not allowed to practice their religion, essentially. Um, circumcision was banned. Um, the dietary laws were banned. Uh, the, the set of, uh, uh, observing the Sabbath was banned. Pretty much anything that was Jewish was was banned. So while they were in exile, they were experiencing persecution from a, a Gentile force. Um, and this is, let me give like, if you don't mind pro me prodding, just to kind of clarify, sure. this is actually the Maccabean, uh, this is, let me repeat that. This is the Antiochus Epiphanes time. Like during that time, they were hard on the Jews and they weren't playing games but the author is playing off Jeremiah and Jeremiah is older, if I'm not mistaken, but not that much older. Mm -hmm. Or is it? Uh, well, Jeremiah is a lot older than, than Daniel is. Um, now there, there, some of the, the, the chapters two through six, there are some texts there that, that seem like they might be from a little after that period, but nothing around that, that same time. Um, and, and we know that that is not an author written writing at that time because they wouldn't, uh, make some of the mistakes and, and some of the historical inaccuracies that they do in, in Daniel. Interesting. Uh, for, for, for example, um, if, if Daniel, if Daniel one, one, the you know, right, right out the gate, if Daniel one, one was written by somebody, um, at the time of Nebuchadnezzar at the time of the Babylonian exile, um, then they would have not have made some of these mistakes. In Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And there are so many problems just right there. It, <laughs> so the, the third year of Jehoiakim starting out is 606 BCE. Um, but in 606 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't the king of Babylon. His father was Nebuchadnezzar. Um, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't the king until 605. And he didn't besiege Jerusalem in the third year of, of, uh, of Jehoiakim either. Um, there, there was no siege of Jerusalem during the, during, uh, the reign of Jehoiakim. Um, he didn't begin the siege of Jerusalem until November or December of 598. Uh, and it didn't finish until 597, uh, which leads to the final issue. If the siege of Jerusalem was in 597, then it wasn't during the reign of Jehoiakim, but his son, Jeconiah, or uh, Jehoiachin. So, and Daniel 9, and Daniel 1 1 not only goes against extra biblical sources here, but it directly contradicts biblical sources. So, not just extra biblical, but it contradicts within the Bible itself uh, in second Kings 24 over and over, it clearly states that King Jehoiachin or Jeconiah, the, the son of, Jeho of Jehoiakim uh, was the King when Nebuchadnezzar besieged the city. Let me get you center. Cause you're about to lay your head on my shoulder and, and <laughs> <laughs> can you center a little bit? There you go. There you go. There you go. A little bit better. Yeah. There you okay. go. Yeah. 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 You just had to sit up cause you're about Sorry, to lay yeah. your head on. You're going to lay your head I on bet, my shoulder. I, 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 I've got one armrest that's lower than the other one. <laughs> no, no, no problem. 
So this is powerful. In and we don't have to get stuck here, but already whoever is piecing Daniel together, whoever's writing Daniel one one and writing this book is uh, probably using either other sources or is com- making up their own sources the best they can to come up with this kind of uh, intro. Well, it's it's likely that Daniel is using. Um, Two different sources, probably the uh, the the chronicler and uh, and King and and Second Kings, um, and he's he's trying to harmonize the two because they also contradict each other. So he's probably he's I, I, my best guess would be that he's trying to find some sort of happy middle ground between the two. This is. It never ends, bro. <laughs> Harmonizing's like the key to every religion, man. Let's make sure this thing works. Okay, so right. what is Daniel? Because I think before, man, when we had you and Doctor um, Doctor Joshua on, you guys were starting in Jeremiah and then working into Daniel. I think it's great that you started at Daniel because Daniel is using this Jeremiah text, or at least the ideas in Jeremiah, and he's trying to create a prophecy if you will he's borrowing old literature you point out in chapters two through six it's obvious older stuff is put in here maybe to make it look like it fits with this i don't know or maybe they just maybe i'll give him the benefit of the doubt and not say this is all like purposeful uh evil but i'll give it like honorary um deceit it's like uh maybe he believes let me let me use some of the stuff that i hold sacred and use it into this text i don't know what are your thoughts I mean, yeah, and I, I think there's there's a lot of a lot of truth in that. I mean, they they weren't the best record keepers, even at, even and at the time, let's, if it if it was indeed written in the second century BCE, and the author was looking at these these texts, and he would have no way to verify them because often, like one historical document was all that there was, and you just had to take it at face value, or that that uh, any any other you know, document, any other source was, you know, just not accessible at, at the time. For example, I don't think that uh, Daniel had access to the Babylonian Chronicles. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think that he had access to some of the, the Babylonian literature that uh, like, you know, some of the, the uh, cuneiform tablets that give us the list of Kings and, and things like that, or he wouldn't make these, these simple mistakes. I don't know if he'd even be able to read them if they're cuneiform. You know what I mean? That's the interesting part too. It's like, dude, this is great that we have this evidence now to back it up. So Daniel, what is, what is Daniel doing with this prophecy and how are these failed prophecies? Go ahead and tell us what build up the case uh, and showing us where the issues lie. You've already pointed out contradictions are there. Those need to be examined, but. So this was supposed to happen at a time of, of peace uh, or supposed to, supposed to end in a time of, of peace in the time of the restoration of Jerusalem and the destruction of Babylon. Uh, and yet here they are, you know, uh, in the second century and they're under persecution of a Gentile force again, you know? Um, so the, the author is look is looking back on, on Jeremiah and the promise of God to restore the temple and to, you know, re- restore Jerusalem and restore the tribes and everything like that. Um, of, of it not happening on top of that, it just a way of, of, um, reinterpreting it, uh, as, uh, as if he was indeed Daniel from that time period. Um, and it was, a way of giving hope to his fellow Jews who were under persecution, just saying, look, you know, it's not, not too much longer. Look like this, like God is going to keep his promise. He is going to, he, you know, he is sovereign and he is going to restore Jerusalem in the temple. So don't, don't worry. That a noble lie and it's okay. It's a noble lie. I mean, I would do the same thing if I were them, if we were in their shoes, we do the same thing. We're not knocking that. We're just trying to, rip apart the hocus pocus that's been developed around this and point out the humanity in this text. I think that's wonderful, actually. So technically what's going on is there's this guy who we don't really know who he is. That's authoring these books, writing it in a time during Antiochus Epiphanes and the Gentiles are being really, really ridiculously rough on the Jews for whatever reason. 
Um, mm-hmm. Not trying to lay complete blame, but they themselves are, he's creating this narrative, playing it back in time, eh, a little over 70 years or so after Jeremiah, where this guy Daniel exists and he's being uh, mistreated. And then finally makes these predictions in the book about the times that the author's actually living in at the moment, as if that back two, three, 400 years ago, they predicted this day would come, you know, that kind of right. thing. Right. Right. Because okay. they had to have some way of explaining why these quote unquote desolations of Jerusalem um, were not brought to an end. Uh, why uh, the, the anti-king crisis was, was, was going on and they do this, through a reinterpretation of the Jeremiah prophecies, uh, through uh, these these visions or um, uh, these angelic revelations, they reinterpreted Jeremiah. So Jeremiah's initial um, meaning sure. is now kind of changed. Is that what you're suggesting? Right, right. Well, it's you know the the, the angel tells them you know it's it's you know no it it it, it's, it wasn't actually seventy years. You know you you, you misunderstood. Uh, because in in Hebrew, these the word for seven and the word for week, um, they they use the same consonants, and so basically the angel was saying, no, 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 you 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 just misunderstood. You didn't you didn't catch the deeper meaning. It was it, it wasn't just seven sevens. It wasn't just forty nine. It, it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just seventy years, but it was seven seventies. It was. Uh, <laughs> or 77s or 70 weeks of years. Uh, so it's, it's actually 490 years. Uh, so you, you just, you misunderstood that. Okay. This gets to the, get, this gets to debate, right? This is where debates start happening and you have an opinion. And I love that about you. Uh, so does Dr. Joshua. We talk all the time about you, man. <laughs> he's like, he's, he's going to be something. Let me tell you. Um, oh, man. man, he's awesome. Oh, I love Dr. Josh. He really is, man. And I love what they're doing. 490 years from when and what What the heck, man? I mean, like, you know what I'm talking about here. Because Christians want to use this 490 for themselves. I mean, you got to leave a little 490 for everybody, man. I, I, you know, everybody's got to have a little bit of that 490 somewhere in their own little uh, eschatology. So what's going on with the 490, man? Um, so you have to remember the, the 490 is split up into three separate parts. You've got the seven weeks and then 62 weeks and then a final seven weeks. Um, so the Christians lump in the seven and the six and the 62 together and say, well, this is to whenever the, the Messiah is going to, um, be, be cut down is at the end of these, uh, these 69 weeks and then the one week is whenever Jesus returns and they completely ignore the fact that there are other divisions. You know, there's a 49 year division and then the next 62 week uh, division. Um, And the first one is whenever the, the anointed priest is supposed to arrive and they don't talk about, and anoints one being cut down until the end of the 62 weeks. So really that there's a 62 week span bef- between what, what the prophecy says, an anointed, an anointed priest or the, 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 the anointed prince arrives. And whenever an anointed one is cut down uh, and they also insert uh, the, these, uh, uh, these definite articles where there are not definite articles. So they will instead of instead of translating it as an an anointed one, they will say the Messiah. Sounds so, a lot better. <laughs> exactly, and they will and and they'll even capitalize Messiah, you know, or yeah. instead of a prince or an anointed one, it's the anointed one or the prince. Uh, you know, it's it, it really points to Jesus, and they take out or they they ignore that the division but like i said between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks and s- make it to where the arrival of the messiah and the messiah being cut down is at the same time interesting so let me ask you this because i know modern eschatology for christians is like that they do a lot of this does the the author of the apo- or the apocalypse of john the book of revelation if you will is he the guy who's already hijacking and misapplying this stuff or 
Okay, so that's the guy that's making the big boo-boo. Okay, guys, be looking out on – watch out when you're reading the Apocalypse of John. John's just doing what Daniel was doing to Jeremiah, okay? He's doing his own little thing, okay? So, um, yeah, I just appreciate you specifying that. And I think it's important, too, on a starting date for when they should apply the 4 490. That's also d- disputed for bias reasons by Christians, you know, Oh no, it had to start later so that it fits Jesus's life in the first century. Can you go into that argument real quick? Yeah. So Christians will, uh, they, they usually claim that it started in 444. Why? Because it's the easiest one to finagle, you know, to, to, to get in there. Um, but in doing so they have to, uh, Sorry, my goats were going crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what were we talking about again? Uh, four, four, uh, 444. Oh, yeah, the right. Christians, they finagle um, that. Yeah. Yeah, so Christians use the use 444 because it's the one that they can best finagle to arrive at 32 or 33. So somewhere around the time that that, uh, that Jesus was, was crucified. Um. And they have no solid grounds. They're backdating. They're kind of going from this and working back 490 years. Right. Right. Or 400 and maybe not 490, but. The- right. Yeah. They, I mean, they, they are, that that's, they, they really are. That's, that's, well, that's what they're doing. Um, but in, in doing so, they, they say that there was this prophetic year and that there were only 360 days in a year instead of 365. And so you, it's going to be off by this amount of years, you know, because it, it didn't quite line up with the, uh, the crucifixion of, of Jesus. Um, you know, the, the, the 400 and well, not the 490 years, but the, uh, the, the 483, the first, uh, first two, two periods, uh, because the, that, that was when he was cut off, uh, that's not 490 years. Um, so, and Christians also can't explain, you know, what, what those last seven years are, um, you know, and, and, and the, and the last seven years is what the focus of the entire prophecy is, is, is over, you know, and John, the, and John, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the first two sections are just, just, just build up, just historical buildup, but the, the readers, the the audience that these that the the compiler of Daniel was was compiling for and writing to, uh, would have seen this as as really significant, you know, because they were they were living in this period, you know, during these three and a half years where the uh, the the abomination of desolation stood, you know, in in the temple, you know, the uh, most likely you know a, a statue or an altar, you know, to another god, you know, maybe uh, uh, Zeus or uh, Apollo, you know something like that. Um, and, and we know through other texts, you know, like there's through second Maccabees, for example, um, that, that Antiochus, you know, would sacrifice pigs and things like that on, on the altar, you know, to, to desecrate the altar and to defile it. And it would, uh, it was referred to as the, the, the abomination that makes desolate. Um, because it, it makes it made made the temple to where it was no longer a holy place, dude. I, I wish I could just blow up bombshells all over the screen because what you're saying so powerful. Technically, just based on what you guys already heard, I just want to dumb it down. What we have is Daniel is, or author of Daniel is playing out this thing that's happened back in the day, a little after Jeremiah as though this is speaking of the future times. And you know, when you get later in Daniel, 8, 9, 10, 11 to 12, all those passages, you start seeing, oh, snap, Uh, the one who makes desolate. Oh, that's Antiochus Epiphanes. Oh, oh, the kingdoms will split. Look at the statue and the vision and all these things. It's clearly talking about their time. That seven-year period is about, their time and the christians did the same thing hijacking this they want to use double fulfillment or shadow and the real fulfillment all this bs to try and come at the conclusion that this applies to them in the first century 
uh, at least the authors of the New Testament. Whereas Christians are doing the same damn thing again, hijacking the New Testament narrative to apply it to Donald Trump and then, you know, and you name it. Like, I'm just giving you an example, though. Mm -hmm. uh, not all Christians do that, but uh, to some moment in the near future or in our time. And they come up with some excuse to try and keep this uh, prophecy for now. And I wanted to say, if the seven weeks to the author of Daniel are happening then in the lifetime of Antiochus Epiphanes and that audience, wouldn't you backdate the 683 years before that as your starting date? Or 400, 483 years, sorry. Wouldn't you go backwards 483 years from the time around Antiochus Epiphanes instead of assuming what the Christians do? Or am I wrong? Well, the Christians wouldn't necessarily think that, you know, the Christians wouldn't, wouldn't see it, wouldn't read it as, you know, is it being, um, needed to be counted back or, or, or anything like that? You know, they, if you were an, um, a reader at the time, you know, uh, and part of the audience, uh, that, that the, the author of Daniel's uh, writing to, you know, you would, you look at this as if it was happening, you know, right now, you know, because right. it, you know, it, in uh, in twenty in nine twenty seven, it talks about the one who makes a covenant with many. You know, and he, the the ruler who is to come that makes a covenant with the many, and they would, as an audience member, you would have known about you know the this alliance made between um, Antiochus the fourth and these Hellenized Jews. Um, uh, you, you can read about that in First Maccabees, uh, First Maccabees one. And uh, he talks about uh, let it, let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles uh, around us. Right. Um, I guess or, what I was saying is that prophetic uh, clock, the, right. the 490 year prophetic clock, mm -hmm. you know, ignoring spending time on the Christians, just pointing out a correct calculation for that author's use of the terms 490 or the 77s. You, you got to backdate it from there. You can't go to the first century and start counting backwards and try to do 483 or 490. They do that. Don't get me wrong, but you're, you're stilling Daniel to try and make your own thing. And Daniel's trying to backdate sometime just after Jeremiah. And what I'm getting at, I guess, in simple question is when do we start the 490? Is there a certain date you would say? Um, would best suit that uh, starting of that time? Um, I, I mean, I would say that it would be at the the uh, the edict by Cyrus. Um, I mean that that's that's the only one that I can think of that would that would be a uh, a, a good candidate. Um, I think that's the one that Daniel, um, the author, would have been talking about. The one that they would have understood. Um, for for one, if it was one of like uh, say, um, not you know, um, if it was a later edict, you know, one of the ones from the the from four forty four, say, uh, yeah. from Nehemiah or, or Ezra, then the the reader in the fifth or sixth century BCE would have no idea what you're talking about because it hadn't happened yet. You know, so they would have to wait for this declaration to to be made for this for this word to go out to rebuild Jerusalem. So in the context of the prophecy, that would mean nothing to them. Um, right. It didn't happen. It, it's, right. Yeah, I right. get it. So, so, I mean, so really the the edict of, of Cyrus would be the 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 best uh, the best candidate just because it would be known by everybody else. So I guess my other question then would be, we kind of touched on this before was Daniel author of Daniel. I keep you, I'm just using Daniel as the author of Daniel. Cause we true, don't even true. know if that's really his name. Do we have an idea of who might've wrote this or no? No, no idea. Um, okay. Some, some Jew during the, during the Maccabean era. Okay. I'm just going to refer to this some Jew as Daniel, just so that we can not have to sure. keep repeating whoever the author of Daniel is. Um, so Daniel is actually playing off Jeremiah. W what's his intention? Is he trying to fix a problem? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, essentially the problem is these, these desolations in Jerusalem have not been taken away. Like, like God said that they would at the end of the exile. Um, that our our we're still under Gentile oppression, so something is still going on. 
Um, so, I mean, and, but Daniel at the same time acknowledges that Israel is still living in sin. And so he does, you know, ask for mercy, you know, ask, ask God for, for mercy and, and, and everything like that. So he, he, he doesn't ask for anything regarding the 70 years at first. He just prays to, to God, you know, just saying that, that he's sorry, you know, and that, that Israel, Israel needs, needs to repent and all this other stuff. Um, just a, a plea, basically a plea for mercy. And then uh, the angel Gabriel comes in to, and explains to him that it was uh just a big misinterpretation this whole time that you guys just didn't understand. It wasn't 70 years. It was actually 490 years. See, that's what always, that's what get, it kind of cracks me up a little, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and I get it. I mean, look, I'm not trying to knock people wanting to create hope, but call it what it is. You know, when you see, look, my, my, my youngins right here, he's peeking his head in. Say, Hey, Hi. they can't see. You. Say, Hey, Hey, Hi. what do you need, buddy? I need sea salt. Okay, there should be some above the uh, oven in there. Okay, that is recording. Okay. All right, love you. Sorry about that. No, you got you're good. 490 seconds to figure things out too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so Daniel is doing this. Jeremiah is making a prediction. Do we know if Jeremiah was written a, supposedly when it was written? I mean, is there a good reason to believe that Jeremiah, or at least this part of Jeremiah, because I love critical scholarship. I love what you do. Like, dude, you'll tell me like Daniel one verse one was written in five sixty three. Daniel one verse two and a half is, uh, you know what I mean? Like, critical scholars don't play around. You can tell when stuff's been tampered with. So, um, I mean, as far as so the character of Jeremiah is said to have lived like in the late seventh century BCE. Um, that's, that's like the, the, the biblical character, but as far as like the, the text itself, I mean, definitely wasn't a product of, uh, seventh century. Um, if, if, if that's what you're asking, um, I just didn't know if it was written after the supposed prediction of the time in which it's supposed to happen, that the 70 years is up. I figured it would at least be between the window of when Daniel says after these 70 years, uh, you know, God's going to, you know, come in and redeem. You guys are going to rule. You know, I think it was kind of an eschatological view. I think Jeremiah was thinking the same end, like uh, kind of like what Daniel's expecting. There's we're supposed to rule the world. Now that might've changed its meaning between the time of whoever wrote Jeremiah to the meaning of the time of whoever wrote Daniel. But I asked that to say, why would the author write a failed prophecy? If it was written after that, you see what I'm saying? Does that okay, make sense? Are, Want me to repeat so, it? it? Yeah, yeah, just d d dumb it, dumb it down. Okay, so if uh, let me just making it simple. Imagine Jeremiah says by 500 BC we're going to be, you know, we're going to be freed, um, and he's supposedly writing it at 600 BC. There'd be no reason for him to have written this around 400 BC. Uh, after if it fails, you see what I'm saying? Why would you write a flopped prophecy that didn't happen? That's kind of my question is when did, when did Jeremiah make this claim that the 70 years and then that's it, God will come in and make things right. He couldn't have written it after it. Right. Right. So the Jeremiah that, that we read is different than the, uh, than the 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 Hebrew text. So, like, if it's developed from the from the Septuagint, um, then the that version, the Greek version, is not as nearly as long as the Hebrew version, and it and it's uh, they they have a, a different order as far as like the the contents of uh, of the text. Um. But as far as like when they were written, I mean, they were probably written s somewhere during the Persian period. Um, Potentially. Uh, probably. Uh, uh, but pr probably later. Um, I, I don't think that it was the early Persian period. Um, so, But definitely not as uh, as early as the... 
uh, sixth century, seventh century uh, okay. BC. I love that. That's how you know you're dealing with a scholar, ladies and gentlemen. I want to yes, no. Uh, you overthink everything. <laughs> yeah, you overthink everything because you're not telling me the answer that I want, right? Because I'm a basic fundamentalist. That's that's how I roll, man. You got to tell me. I want to know the truth. Um, the truth is no one knows when it was written. Simple as that. We can guess. We can have good reasons to propose certain ideas, and that I respect. And res uh, that response was wonderful. I really appreciate that. And I was pushing you too, dude. I was trying to, I was trying to press you on this. So, um, tell me what's going on here, man. We've got Jeremiah saying seventy years. It, it, after the seventy years, is this just the redemption of Israel getting back on top, or is this the end in the Jew? Like, do the Jews think that God's going to have like this golden phase where Israel's going to reign? What is the mindset in Jeremiah to Daniel? Is there an eschatology that's supposed to happen? I mean, so essentially what you have going on here is the, the prediction of a, a, a jubilee. Um, so a jubilee, you know, is whenever the Jews are, uh, you know, they're, they're thrown from the land to let it sit for, for a period. Um, and it, this happens, you know, every, uh, well, every, uh, every 50, every 49 years is, is one, uh, one sabbatical period, uh, followed by the 50th, which would be the, the Jubilee. Uh, it's actually contested whether it's the 49th or the 50th. So, but this constitutes seven, a total of, of seven, uh, uh, sabbatical period. So it's seven sevens makes one, one Jubilee. Um, so, and this is based on, you know, on Leviticus, uh, like Leviticus 25, where it talks about, um, you know, a, a, a Jubilee, you know, for, for six years, you know, you shall, uh, work the land and on the, the seventh, you will, you will let it, let it go, uh, let it go free. Um, or they're the the slaves um, in in Leviticus twenty five when it talks about the the Hebrew ones shall be uh, 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 shall serve with you until the year of the jubilee and then they and they their children go free. Um, so that, that was the the seventh year the seventh year uh, jubilee. So the the forty uh, the forty nine is just seven of those. And then 490 is, uh, is 10 of those sabbatical cycles, 10 of those sets of seven sevens. Um, so it has kind of a, a dual meaning, you know, cause the, the 70 years was the period that the, uh, the period of the Babylonian uh, rule um, over, over, uh, over the Jews and the uh, the the period that they would be exiled from their from their land until they were um, allowed to 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 return. Um, so that's symbolic in the 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 jubilee that if you are uh, taken into servitude or if you're in a, a debt slave, you know, a, a, a debt servant, whatever you want to call it, um, then at the end of those those seven years, then you got to go free. Um, hmm. And so this was that was a representation of of that, but at this at the same time they are to be punished. Um, and there's some biblical precedent for the uh, the punishment being seven times what the uh, what the what the offense was. You know, the, you you get get in return sevenfold, or you have to pay in return sevenfold. So if they, <clears throat> and, and that's if they aren't being obedient, that kind of stuff. Is that like they would have to pay back seven times if if they're disobedient? Right, right. Well, yeah, like it depends on what their 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 offense was. You know, like if you right. steal something, then you have to pay back sevenfold. Or and you mentioned uh, this is like a Levitical priest type thing, which is common in this in this literature here, which you know purity laws, uh, doing things you know in a holy sense, very holy. It might be from the priestly text, if I'm not mistaken. For those who know about the you know um, documentary hypothesis. But I, I just ask that because are they ripping off some of this these legal, if you will, codes to apply it to this? Um, I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say ripping off. I would say that they're using it because it's it's familiar and it would it would have a lot of meaning. 
because where where Jubilee meant a, a return to your to your homeland um, from 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 where you had you had been removed, um, it, it wasn't necessarily a jubilee because you had to have your 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 freedom back as well. So even though these people living during this during this this entire king crisis in, in the second century, um, even though they weren't uh, deported from their land like they were during the period of, of Babylonian exile in the sixth century, they were still ex experiencing um, uh, this uh, this separation from from their their traditional way of life and 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 traditional Jerusalem and and how how Jews should be living. So under this Seleucid rule or this 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 Hellenistic rule. Um, everything that made Jerusalem special was no longer permitted, was no longer, uh, was actually penalized. And Jerusalem became just another, uh, another Hellenized, uh, city, like, like the, the rest of the, uh, the Roman world at the time. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So where's the problem at Jim? What, what are the problems in this? I mean, it just I, I'm looking for failures, right? That's been the point is like poking holes. But what what are some of the problems that we're we're having here? So the, the problem, the biggest problem is also probably the biggest, quote unquote, blessing um, in terms of um, a. A critical uh, a critical assessment of, of the text, um, because it gives us a really accurate date. Um, in chapter 11, um, from verse one to ver or from verse two to verse, uh, 39, um, it's accurate. It's an accurate representation of the, the, all the events happening during the anti-king crisis. Can you cover some of those just to keep, get people zeroed in on them? What's that? Do you have some of those in the top of your head that you could actually just spit off the top that supposedly happened? I mean, that were accurate. Oh, that that talk about the the uh, the abomination of of desolation, or um, uh, um, yeah, let me pull up my notes real quick. I do want to give you some because I think that'll build up what you're trying to say, and then when all of a sudden, plot, you know, it's cool to let them know like this happened, this happened, this happened, but then here's the problem. Right. Right. Um, okay. All right. So for, for example, in chapter, uh, in chapter 11, uh, in verses two through four, it's describing the end of the, uh, the Persian empire, um, the, the rise and the fall of Alexander the great. Um, and it, it caused his empire to be divided into four regions. Right. And it, 11, uh, five through six talks about, um, the King of the South. Um, that's, and the, the rise of the King of the South, that's, that's Ptolemy the first, um, as, and the, uh, well, as, as well as, uh, um, Seleucus, um, Seleucus the first was, uh, the ruler over Syria at the time. Uh, and th then it says the daughter of the King of the South. Well, that was Berenice, um, the daughter of Ptolemy the second. Um, she married, uh, Antiochus the second, um, in 252 BC and the, uh, as Daniel calls it, the offspring um, that she, uh, of her and Antiochus were killed in 246. Um, and 11, seven through nine talk about how Ptolemy the third, um, uh, who is Bernice's brother, the daughter of the, the King of the South, um, how, how, uh, how he and the, the branch from her roots, quote unquote, attack the Seleucid kingdom who Daniel calls the fortress of the king of the north and they won uh, that was 241 and it describes how Seleucus the second who they uh, they call the king of the north um tried to um invade um the uh the Ptolemaic kingdom um 10 through 13 talks about how how um uh, uh the sons of Seleucus uh the Seleucus third and Tychus the third how they um, continued against uh, the quote unquote king of the south, uh, Ptolemy the fourth, 
and uh, Ptolemy eventually defeats uh, Antiochus in 217. Um, but like Daniel says, due to his pride, um, Ptolemy V uh, was defeated um, by Antiochus in 198. Um, then it talks about how in uh, verses 14 through 19, how the 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 lawless among your people who were the the Jewish supporters of Hellenization, how they joined forces with Antiochus and fought against the uh, 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 the the Ptolemies. Um, and so in 200 BC, Antiochus defeated the, the Ptolemies and caused um, some of their forces to uh, go into like Jerusalem, Sidon, some other cities. And uh, he conquers um, a Roman general. Uh, I'm sorry. He um, he is he he tries tries to conquer um, these these other regions, um, but he's killed by a Roman general um, who Daniel calls a commander in 187, a guy named Lucius Scipio. Um, and Verses 20 through 28 talk about the reign of Seleucus IV. It says within a few days he shall be broken. He didn't reign very long at all. Um, and it says uh, that uh, that someone will obtain the kingdom through intrigue. Um, and Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, he um, obtained the kingdom, the Seleucid kingdom, um, he uh, through through uh, by by usurping. Um, he he killed the high priest, uh, um, priest uh, Onias III, who Daniel calls the, pr the Prince of the Covenant. Um, the next year, he invades Egypt, and on his way back to Syria, um, he's upset and butthurt about uh, getting, his, getting his butt kicked, well, actually about getting uh, betrayed, and uh, he attacks Jerusalem. And Daniel says in verse 28, I believe, it says uh, that his heart will be set against the Holy Covenant. Um, 29 through 35, talk about how Antiochus, um, tries to invade the Seleucid, uh, the Seleucid kingdom, um, but is stopped by the quote unquote ships of Katim, um, who are the, the, uh, the, the Romans or the Roman representatives. Um, and then Antiochus attacked Jerusalem in 168 and which is where he entered, entered the temple, uh, set up the statue. Uh, he set up the abomination that makes desolate. Um, which also first Maccabees one talks about. Um, and it, then it says that the people who are loyal to their God shall stand firm and take action, which is talking about the, uh, the, essentially the, the Maccabean, uh, revolt, um, which started with, uh, Matthias and, and, and his sons, um, being the first person to actually stand up to these, uh, these, uh, Seleucid forces, uh, well, it, to standing up to Antiochus um, and 36 through 39 are the last verses that are historically accurate in chapter 11. And they just talk about how awful Antiochus is and that he has no respect for Yahweh um, and no respect for his gods. And then verses 40 um, through chapter 12. Um, it's the, th this was supposed, this is what is supposed to be, a prophecy that this is what was a mystery to the audience at the time 1140 through verse through chapter 12 uh somewhere in the middle of chapter 12 they had no idea what was what was going to happen um all they could see is that it seems that he's writing in the sixth century and it seems that he is accurate all the way up to this point so why wouldn't he keep being accurate but the problem is is that's when the prophecy dies off and that's what gives us the date of 165, 164 uh, BCE. Um, that's uh, that's uh, right at it, the years after Antiochus attacked uh, Jerusalem and the years that it stops becoming accurate. Um, like when it talks about where he would die, um, when he would die, uh, the, the actual return of 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 god the the fulfillment of the promise that he would restore jerusalem well it hasn't been restored so that's obviously incorrect um and and, and the earliest christians interpreted 
this is meaning Antiochus um, as well, but they just saw a huge gap um, that would that would end at at Jesus or at the at the the second coming of Jesus. Um, so that I mean the, they they interpreted certain chapters these ways as well, um, but parallel chapters church, right? they might interpret a different way. Early church fathers like. Yeah, uh, like uh, Tertullian, uh, um, Augustine, Hippolytus, um, uh, Origen. Um, they, yeah. So give me an example, if you don't mind, of like you, you were giving us an example. Just kind of give us an example more on that. So you're saying that um, from Daniel's day, do they acknowledge that this stuff didn't happen or they don't, they just act like Daniel was correct in his understanding or do they realize that there was, it, it didn't happen. There wasn't a restoration in Jerusalem and stuff like that, but that was because it's talking about Jesus. I mean, what? So the, the early disagreement uh, stemmed from this, this pagan philosopher uh, um, named, uh, named Porphyry, who uh, was in the, the second century, sometime in the mid to late second century um, CE. Uh, writing a commentary on Daniel um, identifies Antiochus as this, this person being mentioned in this text and also um, uh, identifies the accuracy. Um, he, 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 he notices the accuracy up to 11 verse 39. And then from 1140 on it's, it's uh, it's inaccurate. And that's how he also dates it to the time of Antiochus the fourth. But the disagreement wasn't whether or not it was talking about Antiochus the fourth or about Alexander the great or, or any of that. Um, the, the main controversy controversy was the claim that it was written in the second century instead of the sixth century. So the, most of the disagreements didn't stem around the identification of the, of the, uh, of, of Antiochus, but about the, the alleged dating of it. Interesting. So the yeah. dating is a problem and we've pointed out, obviously there's issues here. Uh, the dating does point to a newer book. It's not, uh, it's not as old as you think, but right. in what way do they apply Daniel to Jesus or do these early church fathers not really try to do that? Because I know lots of Christians want to double down or double fulfill double prophecy, that kind of stuff. But the resurrection there's a lot of people who want to take that resurrection theme and apply that to the general resurrection that Christians want to use. Um, what do you do with that? You know? Well, so, I mean, Christians essentially in order to make this fit, they have to do a lot of damage control. Um, it, it, it'll either conflict with datings of Jesus's birth or of his, uh, crucifixion or of earthquakes or lunar eclipses or solar eclipses or uh, however they interpret it. Th th that's the thing about it. However they interpret it, 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 it means giving up something else, uh, you know, giving up the accuracy of, of another claim. Um, you know, Christians look at Daniel as pointing to, uh, to Jesus um, but they can't explain what the significance of the three and a half years that the uh, the the abomination of desolation stands in the temple um, or of the other three and a half years that end in the return and the the judgment of the Gentiles. Um, so, I mean, there's, um, you know, they, they can't explain all of Daniel within the context of their explanations. That's um, a good if they use 444, they can't explain what the first uh, what the first 49 years meant, or what the following uh, the following 63 weeks meant, or 62 weeks. Uh, excuse me. Or a meant. lot of they'll say we're on a pause right now, and the last seven years hasn't started yet. You know, like we're in this little pause area, and they're still trying to postpone, and well, it's going to happen in in some contemporary to the 20th 20th 21st century have done this to try and say the seven weeks or the seven years um have happened uh you know or they're happening and there, there's date setters that have failed time and time again still using this book so i right. guess 
my whole intention was maybe different than yours in this uh, episode. And that was me to just try to like, you know, put the book down guys, you know, like stop trying to read it. Don't get me wrong, but quit playing games. Like look, for, look at it for what it is. Stop trying to run and look at passages. Like here's an example. Uh, his name shall be called Emmanuel. Okay. And applying that to Jesus. That's what Christians did. But you are literally ripping off the contemporary meaning to the author who wrote and his name shall be called Emmanuel. You're you're hijacking, and I know Pesher was a common tool, you know, Midrash and things like that were used to come up with these methods and whatnot. But um, people are doing that, and it's harmful, man. Like waiting for the rapture, the end, the fear of all that kind of stuff, apocalypse. If you don't believe you're going to end up going to this place, don't worry, punishment's coming. Like what? You know, that's right. just no, no good, man. No good. And I just wanted to get you to poke holes at Jeremiah and Daniel and kind of show, I call it poking holes, but really it's just illuminating what's going on deeper than what right. you're going to get if you just read your Bible. Like you're looking at multiple sources. Like when you were quoting um, in Daniel 11, two through 39, showing, Hey, this is what happened. You're not just saying that because, well, Daniel says this. No, there are extra biblical literature, and a lot of the sources are from the enemy, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, purporting this idea and showing that this is accurate, that this is really what happened. And then all of a sudden, eh, you go south right after that. So I, I just appreciate you illuminating that. Is there anything you'd like to add that I haven't said? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I didn't have to poke holes in anything. I mean, the, the holes were already there. I just took the duct tape off. That's, that's really all I did. <laughs> that was actually really a great point. Wow. I was going to use the term holy, but you know, it, it's. Yeah, that it, works. That's enough. Yeah, that's enough. I think you've done enough damage here, my friend. Uh, you can, uh, go off and put your cape on and, uh, and I'm just kidding. <laughs> dude, seriously though. Uh, I really want to hear your dissertation when you get done and you actually graduate. I think you're going to do a great job, man. I, I seriously do. When you do, Thanks, I'd like to hear your dissertation on the channel. Um, to bring your paper. Let's, let's get graphs up. Let's pull like images and like do something deep. I'd like to hear what you have, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, pro probably going to have to just do maybe just parts of it or just really summarize it. But yeah, d definitely. I think so, because how long is it going to take you to pre present this? Oh, hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys let me know what you think in the comment section. And Jim, you still have the YouTube channel, correct? Yep, sure do. Uh, YouTube.com slash, slash Jim Majors, yeah. Are you still running it? Are you still like doing things on it? Um, I, I am starting to do it again. Uh, yeah, trying to trying to get back in the uh, the run of things. Just it's been a crazy time with school and everything. I got you. Go down in the description. Make sure you guys subscribe to his channel. He's going to bring more content. And Jim Majors is known to do quite a bit of debating online. Uh, he's done a lot of debates with Christians mainly, but um, I'm sure you're open to debate people on different topics over time. Mainly the Christians, though. You have a lot of fun with that. So, yep. And you talked about Christian martyrdom. So if you haven't seen the shows we've done with him before, go check them out. But show him some love in the description and check out his channel. Like the content, you know, give him some words of encouragement. If you want to see him peel back some duct tape again, let me know because I always enjoy having Jim on the show, man. Jim, thank you so much, bro. Thanks, man. Always have a good time. Thanks. You too, man. And we got to do another collab, bro. I'm going to have to bring you and Dr. Josh on and do something again, dude. That was fun. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. And don't forget, we are Myth Vision. I have hundreds of videos on the Patreon. Become a Patreon and get early access to everything I ever launch. Join the Twitter. I've got a Discord chat room. You guys can help grow the community. One-time PayPal or Cash App if you want to help us out with a donation. And join our Facebook groups, man. Let's make this thing happen.